This week's ch first chapter Friday is I Can Make This Promise by Christine Day. And I chose this book this week because uh, November is Native American Heritage Month. So it's, a, it's an important um, opportunity to celebrate some Indigenous authors and books about Indigenous characters. And I also think it's important to um, uh, choose a book like this one because it's about um, modern day um, Native Americans and I think a lot of people's experience reading books and stories about Native Americans have been people who live in the past or people who live in other countries. And um, I, I want to make sure that people, that, that folks have some experience reading about what life really is like in the modern day for Indigenous people in the United States. So um, this book was on our summer reading list this past year. So some of you may have already read it. It also won the um, American Indian Library Association um, Youth Literature Award. The dedication in this book says, For the grandmothers and mothers who came before me. Prologue, where are you from? I never thought, this is, this is Athena, by the way. Hi, Athena. I never thought of myself as different until my first day of kindergarten. I remember round tables with flimsy tops, Plastic chairs with shiny metal legs, books and stuffed animals were gathered around a fake tree in the reading corner. Cloud-shaped mobiles hung from the ceiling, strands of paper raindrops suspended in midair. A bright yellow sun was painted across one wall. The alphabet was spelled out in a rainbow of uppercase letters. My classmates already seemed to know each other. Everyone was talking and laughing and shouting. I was one of the tallest people in the room, but I felt invisible. I didn't know how to join the conversations, the noise. I wasn't even sure if I wanted to. Mrs. Vespucci saw me hovering near the classroom door. She hurried over and knelt before me. Her smile revealed straight white teeth. <clears throat> she reminded me of a fairy tale princess. Her voice was like a melody, her hair like spun gold. I imagined her singing lullabies to an audience of fawns and bluebirds. Hello, Edith. A jolt of surprise before I remembered my name tag. A school issued, issued lanyard was looped around my neck, clipped to a laminated square. Edith with an illustrated elephant. E for elephant. E for me. Wow, the teacher's grin widened as she stared at my face. What are you? I told her, I'm Edie. Oh, Edie, that's your preferred name? Where are you from, sweetheart? You're such a pretty girl. I live in Seattle. Yes, that's true. But where are you originally from? Seattle? Mrs. Vespucci laughed, but I wasn't sure what was funny. Do you know where your parents lived before they came here? Her questions made me feel panicked. This was my first test, and somehow I was failing. I couldn't speak. I didn't understand what she was asking. I didn't know what she wanted from me. I've gotten the question a lot since then. What are you? Where are you from? What am I? My father is American and my mother is Native American. Technically, dad has roots in Germany, England, and Wales. But I don't mention this because it feels dishonest. I've never visited those places. I don't know much about them. I'm not even sure where they are on the European continent. So I just say dad is American, which works out fine because no one asks about him anyways. They just jump straight to mom. They want to know what it means to be Native American. They ask me what tribe I'm from. They ask me what if I know what buffalo tastes like. They ask me about my spiritual beliefs. They ask me about the percentages and ratios of my blood. My answer remains the same. I don't really know. My mom was adopted. Chapter 1, The Big Bang, July 4th. Fireworks are banned in my neighborhood. There are too many trees, too many houses. So this year, for 4th of July, my parents are taking me to the Tulalip Reservation, about 20 miles north of the city. They sell all kinds of fireworks, and they have a huge field where you can set them off. The place is crowded and colorful and chaotic. It's amazing. My parents lead the way to the booths. There's a food truck parked beside the big gravel lot selling authentic Mexican tacos. The smell of cooked seasoned meat fills the air, mixing with the peppery gunpowder from the fireworks. I can practically feel it, 
the little flecks of grime all over my skin. Mom asks, do you need these, Edie? She opens her palm, revealing a little package of earplugs. I shake my head. I'm okay, thanks. The booths are set up in several rows. The nearest one is decorated with red, white, and blue streamers and a huge banner that shouts fireworks in bold letters. The booth across from it is lime green with little alien heads and UFOs outlined all over it in black paint. Another is hot pink with candy colored rockets arranged in bouquets on its counter. The next is blue, which is the Seattle Seahawks logo stenciled in dark and stark white and silver, plus the number 12. The one is shaped like the space needle. I like this graffiti. I like the bright colors, the bold lines. I wonder if they created drawings and stencils first, or if they just grabbed their cans of spray paint and improvised. I also wonder if they keep sketchbooks or have favorite places to draw like I do. I'm always curious about other artists and their habits, their unfinished drafts, their inspirations. As we keep moving, I can't help but drink it all in. I've never been to a reservation before. Each person I make eye contact with feels significant. It's possible some of them are distant relatives. I could be walking past cousins or aunties right now, and I wouldn't even know it. A rock and roll version of the Star Spangled Banner starts blaring out of nowhere, and I glance around myself, trying to find the speakers. But as the loud electric guitar mimics the sound of Oh Say Can You See, I instead notice a food vendor with signs that say they have traditional Native American fry bread. I stop and stare. The line is huge. The menu is handwritten on a whiteboard. An ice-filled cooler contains sodas and bottled lemonades. There are two open counters, one where you pay, one where you wait for your order. I watch as a girl received her food. The fry bread is a rumpled golden brown disc served on a paper plate. It almost looks like an elephant ear. As the guitar transitions to a choppy, what so proudly we hailed, something knocks into the back of my legs. I stumble and turn around. A dog peers up at me with watery bloodshot eyes. He's panting hard and he his fur is mangy and he looks ha but he looks happy, surprisingly calm. I thought all dogs hated fireworks, but he doesn't seem to mind the noise or the chaos. He just looks a little lost. I extend my hand to him. Hi, puppy. He lifts his big nose, sniffs my fingers, pushes his snout against my palm. His tail wags ferociously as he inches closer. That's a good boy, I say. You're a good boy. I check his neck, but he isn't wearing a collar. I glance around. Cash registers chime and the sound of laughter are eclipsed by a huge boom. Shoes crunch across the gravel. A group of men walk by in mismatched baseball jerseys. A teenager adjusts her sunglasses. Her colorful beaded bracelets slide down her brown forearm. A guy with two long dark braids is wearing a Batman tank top. A toddler is in mid-meltdown, hands clamped over her ears, face crumpled as she cries out. Poor thing, I murmur. I stroke the dog's head, distracted. Where's your owner? The rock and roll version of the Star Spangled Banner is no longer recognizable. The guitar riffs have dissolved into wails. It doesn't sound like or the ramparts we watched. It doesn't sound like anything, just crashing notes and frantic energy. I turn in the other direction and an older woman catches my gaze and holds it. She's seated on a stool at the edge of the crowd. Her t-shirt bears the message, find our missing girls. Huh, I wonder what that's about. Edie? Mom's voice cuts through the blaring guitar and blasting fireworks. What are you doing? She places her hand on my shoulder and gently steers me away. Honey, you can't pet random dogs like that. It's not safe. Look at how big he is. He might hurt you. Dad's behind her. Your mother's right. I know he's cute, but you need to be careful. But he's alone, I say. Shouldn't we help him find his way home? Someone will come for him, Mom says and I can barely hear her as the guitar screeches. Don't worry. She tugs me away, but I look back. The dog sits in the middle of the walkway. His ears perk up, and his tongue lolls out of the corner of his mouth as he watches me leave. <coughs> we stop at a booth called The Big Bang. The words are spelled out in swollen graffiti font. The letters are big and puffy and white, and they remind me of squished marshmallows. A brown-skinned teenager stands behind the counter. He's wearing a white tank top and has a little barbell pierced through his eyebrow. 
He grins, as if he's genuinely happy to see us. Afternoon, folks. He flicks his chin up in greeting. How's it going? Dad nods in response. We're doing well, thank you. A short silence follows us as we look around the booth. The top shelf holds the biggest boxes, encased in glossy wrappers. Their labels alternate between sounding patriotic and menacing. Rocket's Red Glare, American Outlaw, Rolling Thunder, Sabotage. The lower shelves contain smaller boxes and open trays of fireworks. Where are you guys from, he asks. We live in Seattle, Mom answers. Ah, he nods, understanding that urban life. You like it out there? Mom smiles, most of the time. Good, good, glad to hear. He drums his hands on the countertop. So, what kind of fireworks are you looking for? I know we want some sparklers, some Roman candles, maybe a fountain or two. All right. He turns to his lowest shelf and grabs two trays, tilting them forward to reveal their con contents. I have these two kinds, he says. One tray is filled with bundles of slender gray-brown sticks. The other has bundles of hot pink sparklers. The top half of each one is wrapped in dyed magenta yellow teal tissue paper and laced with a gold ribbon. We pick the pretty ones, then select some Roman candles and two stubby fountains. The boy places the long cardboard box on the counter before us and starts piling our stuff inside it. Anything else? Both my parents look at me, and the boy does too. I feel the heat rise in my cheeks. I go rigid under their scrutiny. Edie, Mom asks. Her voice is gentle, a half whisper at most. I glance at the shelves and shrug, feeling awkward. I wish I she, she wouldn't have said anything. I hate being put on the spot in front of strangers. <clears throat> the boy snaps his fingers. Here, he says, how about this? He crouches behind the counter. I can hear the scrape of crates sliding up across the ground. He straightens back up and he stands directly across from me, smiling. Ever seen one of these before? He holds up a cylinder wrapped in a turquoise label. It has a black platform on one end. Its fuse pops out the top like a little red tongue. I shake my head. Really? He sets it down on the counter, taps it with his finger. That's too bad, he says. These guys are my favorites out of everything I've got here. That's why I keep them hidden. They're reserved for special people. He winks, and now I'm certain my face is all red and splotchy. What is it, I mumble, hoping he'll stop looking at me. He slides the firework across the counter. A gift, he says. A surprise. I inspect the wrapper, hesitating. Go on, he urges. Take it. I accept the firework and hold it close against my chest. Thank you, Mom says, her voice brimming with gratitude. She retrieves her wallet from the depth of her purse. How much do I owe you? Twenty-four fifty. Dad hoists the box into his arms and frowns. That's a bit low, isn't it? It's all good. The boy inclines his head toward me. Little sisters is on the house. My parents protest. They want to pay him the full amount, but he waves their offer away. He says, don't worry about it. Just take care of yourselves out there. And he sounds like he really means it. So check out this book at our library. It actually um, it has a little bit of a mystery component to it. Um, the um, main character, Edie, and her friend find a box in the attic with some really mysterious things in it that cause them to kind of question um, her heritage and what may or may not have happened to her mother when she was Edie's age. So come and check it out.